December 97, mm-hmm. we raised our first round of 3 million. Uh, we went and built the team and we came out with the product. So this was sort of going to be a earth shattering <laughs> effort where we were going to change the way completely of how uh, chips are designed. What's up, what's up? Welcome to Stories 100 Podcast. This is your host, AJ Sharma. Do you know what is the quickest way to build success at anything in life? The quickest way to do it is to learn from people who have already done it. That's exactly what we're going to do today. Our next guest, Ram Gopalan, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's made multiple companies, started them from scratch, built them to successful businesses. Let's get to know more about his journey. Without further ado, let's welcome Ram Gopalan to the podcast. Hey Ram, uh, welcome uh, to the podcast today. We are so delighted to have you today um, on the podcast. Um, you know, I know that I've, uh, you know, I've known you personally since 2006, and I've seen you, you know, uh, through different accomplishments, through your business, the projects that you worked on, and I've really, you know, uh, admired your journey. So what I, I, and I, today I was looking forward to this podcast so much with you because of the fact that not only you're really successful in business, you're actually a great human being. I know personally, I have relied on you for many things in my life. So, and you always been there. So I'm so thankful for that. So, uh, and for the viewers today, we're going to get to know more about your journey, how you got started, and then how you built up a success in business. So welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good? I'm doing good. As you can see, I'm preparing for my Move to the tropical city of Singapore very soon. Oh wow! You're traveling out there, or you are? Um, uh, how long are you there for? My wife is moving there for three years, so I'm following her and continuing my entrepreneurial journey from Singapore. Wow, that is nice. That is, that is nice. So um, she's going there for professional work, or about, right. that's that's the call of it. Right. Her journey is taking her there, as she jokingly told me that I supported you during your entrepreneurial days by working in the corporate world. Now it's yep. my turn to support her in her career and journey. That is awesome. That is awesome. That's beautiful. That's very nice. So, um, and, and uh, we wish you uh, good luck on that. And, and and Singapore is a great country. You know, heard, heard many good things about it. So that's that's very nice. Thank so. So what we, what I want to ask you is, that, you know, before we talk about the entrepreneurship, right? Let's talk a little bit about your early days. How you, you know, where you went to college, what did you, what did you study? And a little bit of your first jobs that you did. Can you talk a little bit about that? So that we can build from that, this whole conversation. I grew up in Dehradun uh-huh. and then uh, I moved to Delhi uh, as my father was being transferred. And, mm-hmm. uh, I did my high school in Delhi and I did my engineering at IIT Delhi and then I came over to Canada. I used to be uh, interested in bioengineering, which is the cross of engineering and uh, medicine or health. And I was getting ready to go for a PhD at Vanderbilt when uh, I came for a holiday trip to California because some of my friends were here happened to meet someone from National Semiconductor, said, come on over. And uh, I got a job and landed up at National Designing Semiconductors, which was a far cry from uh, bioengineering. A, a little bit different, right? <laughs> and uh, I have been in the Valley ever since. And Silicon Valley, as people talk about it, is indeed 
there is a lot of truth to it that uh, once you're here it's like an addiction and uh, the people surrounding you the energy the various things that happen kind of push you in that direction so it was sort of a automatic push into eventually entrepreneurship yeah that that is awesome and you know what it is and that's what i i agree with you um i'm originally from california right now i'm in florida but this is something that a lot of people say about silicon valley it's just the atmosphere and like you mentioned the energy that people bring together is just it, it is just amazing and it just kind of lifts everybody higher that's how it is especially if you're an entrepreneur like like you are it really it really helps out to be you know in connection with the like minded people who are on the same mission as you that or uh, if you go to any of the parties inevitably you know seven out of 10 discussions will be around i'm starting a company or i'm working in a startup that's amazing so very soon you feel i got to do this too <laughs> no that that is amazing so you know uh you know we're going to get into more about you know the companies that you started and you made successful exits of those companies through acquisitions but i wanted to ask you even before that how did you get the idea of entrepreneurship that you wanted to be an entrepreneur i mean like i said it's it's all the surroundings and then a little bit of it is when you're in the corporate world in a large company my last job was with ibm and you know how it's a state stoic company <laughs> and you kind of seeing the energy around you and the mismatch in culture with a big corporation like ibm you're always getting itchy so i remember those were the days when cd rom based stories were the big thing you know there were uh reader rabbit and stuff it may be something that you may not remember because you didn't have kids at that time and so i figured that was one area where uh, i would is definitely was going to be successful where all these educational stuff through cd roms uh wrote a bun in uh, uh, in amarin north of san francisco it was one of the most successful companies uh, building cd rom based uh, education stories reader rabbit series and stuff so i came up with this idea because in those days to connect a pc to a tv it was a very clunky thing and people were not that tech savvy so i said why not we build a small box like a vcr that you can put in your tv music system cabinet where you could play these educational cd rom so it was basically a pc just a single function pc to connect to the tv and uh, play the cd roms you could play it like a vcr so i was very excited and uh, i a common friend uh, who had started a company called neo magic they were having a board meeting and a sequoia board member was there for that meeting so he said i can arrange for you to talk to him after the meeting to pitch your idea so i was eagerly waiting there I met him he was one of the top uh, pcs who invested in yahoo and all the successful internet companies and uh, so he heard my story and he said wow this is a great idea this is definitely going to be uh, a successful uh, uh, thought process and business area and blah blah and my inside my heart was racing at 150 miles per hour that okay here comes the money and I'm off to the races but then <laughs> so he awesome. took me he took me high and then he dropped me like a stone saying but I'm not going to fund this company so, <laughs> <laughs> so I asked him why he said look there is no unique uh, technology barrier here this is a basic pc with a slightly different shape box and ins and outs so the compacts of the world can easily build this they can build it much cheaper they you need a lot of consumer budget for marketing and advertising and uh, i cannot be giving you enough money to do all those tv ads and super bowl ads and stuff so compacts or the ibms and any of these pc manufacturers would be the one who would be successful with it so i don't think it's a great idea for a startup company so the lesson learned there was an idea may be good but as a business it may not be that great 
So that's the key to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned in my Stanford business classes was that uh, when you want to have a win-win situation, that's when you really win. So you always have to think where, how can the other side win, as well as how can I win in that deal? And once you arrive at the side, what we are talking about is, is this that, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're referring to not only you're thinking that, okay, you as an entrepreneur are willing, winning at the same time, the consumer. And also, if you want to take this big, you have to take investors along with you. It has to be a winning game for them as well. So th right. th I believe that's what you're referring to. Yes, the old adage is true that you should never play with your money. You should play with other people's money. <laughs> that's amazing. But you know, uh, the, the thing is this, that that actually sounds exciting and that sounds easy, but at the same time, you have to be able to convince other people on, on your ideas and get them on board. And that can be a difficult part too, because at the same time, you know, these people are, are very well versed in business. They've had multiple businesses themselves. So it really has to be, like you said, a win-win situation for everybody. And being able to think through that, that's how you take your small business idea into a big vision, right? That's, that's uh... very true. But one thing to keep in mind, as you see many of the entrepreneurs, uh, at the beginning, the ideas look like totally bat crazy. Uh -huh. Because if it is something that makes sense and it looks like a winner, then everybody would be doing it. So it has to look totally impossible and weird. I mean, okay. take some examples like Facebook. Mm -hmm. When it was first started, it was just a way uh, by Mark Zuckerberg because they couldn't go to all the different dorms and because it was winter and snow. So he created this platform to share information in the campus setting. And eventually it evolved to something else. Take Airbnb, for example. Mm -hmm. When they first started and they went and told the investor that, you know, this is the platform by which people can rent their houses out. Everybody laughed them out for a year. Exactly. And look where they are, they're a public company. That's true. So the key is your idea has to be nearly look impossible because that's how other people are not doing it. Then you have to have a passion to really take it through all the challenges and Eventually, many times, the final shape looks very different from how you started. So you have to be able to, you know, like a river meander around the big rocks and mountains, and eventually you'll see success. Exactly. You're right about that. You got to be able to mold yourself. And it's more like a journey than, uh, than a lot of times when people start off with, you know, I talk to entrepreneurs, work with a lot of successful people. But it almost seems that they, they start with this idea, like what you're sharing. This is a general vision, what they want to accomplish. But you have to be able to adjust yourself to the idea, to all the things that go around it. And, and eventually, like you said, the success looks a lot different than how you started maybe a year or two ago. And the ones that are able to mold themselves are the ones that actually get to the end. Right. So it's all about having that passion and not worrying about success, not worrying about making money. Because if you have the passion and the drive and you keep on uh, learning from what's happening around you and listening to people and still do what you believe in, you got to believe in what you're doing. Eventually all the success, the money and everything. That is true. That is true. And and I, and I, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're sharing that because most uh, uh, more, you know, I've read some articles online. I do a little bit of research on this as well. It's that a lot of people start off with the idea of making a lot of money. That's why they want to go in business. But like you said, it's a little different than that. You just follow your passion and eventually you figure out the business around that. And that's what gives you the energy to keep going. Versus if you only think about the money itself, so it's not going to come like, you know, maybe, maybe that's something that, you know, I would like to ask you as well. It doesn't come within, you know, like the first year or two, you know, or it takes a little bit of time to do that. But how do you keep going while, while it's, you know, while it's, you're not there yet? Because I think that's what a lot of people struggle with as well. It's challenging. Uh, it's uh, difficult at times. And that's where, uh, 
uh, you know, the support structure around you is very important. I remember when I started my first venture funded company, uh, my second daughter was born uh, but she was two, three years old. Uh -huh. Then for the next uh, two years, I never saw her because I'd leave at 7 a.m. in the morning and I would close the doors of the company at midnight. So you have to be around. You can't just ask the engineers to be there and you come home to watch TV. So by the time I came back, she'd be asleep. So the only time I saw her was for half a day on Sunday, uh, which is what I had kept. So there my wife, having a corporate job, having the health insurance, having a base income coming in, uh, helped a lot. So if you have those kind of support systems in place, then you can go ahead with your passion. And the key thing to remember, like you mentioned, is the journey that matters, not the destination. And uh, if it is success and money, it will come. If yeah. it is a failure, you have to look at it positively and say, this is what I learned from it. And so when you go back to do it the next time, uh, you don't, you know, you learn from the mistakes and do things differently. That is true. Uh, that, that is true. And you know what? And that is simply the truth. What you're saying is this, that failures are just, uh, so to say, they're just steps of the process instead of, Instead of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of us feel that it's just, you know, uh, okay, this is this is defining what happened and I will never be successful again. Whereas it's just a building block for your success. That, that, that's what it is. That's all. Awesome. So your first, uh, uh, your first success as an entrepreneur. So I hope I'm spelling the name right of the company. Is it Cognigine? Yeah, Cognigine was the short form of Cognitive Engines. Okay, Cognitive yeah. Engines. Okay. It was a semiconductor company uh, because of my background and experience. And uh, I came out of IBM. Mm -hmm. I had worked at Chips and Technologies earlier. Mm -hmm. Got together with three of my friends from there, mm -hmm. George, Rakesh and Rupan. Uh -huh. We came up with this idea. We struggled for a year to raise money as we were building a lot of the proof of concept. But eventually, we were fortunate. December '97, mm -hmm. we raised our first round of three million. Uh, we went and built the team, and we came out with the product. So this was sort of going to be a earth-shattering <laughs> effort, where we were going to change the way completely of how uh, chips are designed. So, mm -hmm. in in a traditional sense, the chip is like building a house where you lay the foundation, you build the structure, and once you are done, that's what it is. You, if you have to change something, you got to break the wall or uh, make a major change. So what we were going to do was come up with a way to design chips where there was a base, and then there was a fluid structure on top in the software that they could change to change the flavor of the chip in real time. Uh -huh. Magnanimous goal uh, comes from a lot of the Indian education background, uh, like an IIT education, that you want to do earth shattering stuff. And, you know, the big, big thing to learn from entrepreneurship is that you commonly relate success to the big successes like the Facebooks and the Googles and uh, Sun Microsystem, which is the Oracle. There are a few and far between like that, but there are many successes uh, that are much smaller, but they're still successes. And uh, so the key is not to set a goal that is so way beyond that the probability of success is low and failure is high. And so the key, as I, in baseball parlance, I commonly refer to this is that you can hit a home run or you can hit a base hit. Uh -huh. And you can still win a game by doing a lot of base hits. Exactly. And uh, that's really what I think is more uh, commonly possible with entrepreneurship is to focus on base hits. Because you do a couple of base hits, eventually you'll hit the home run. Exactly. And each base hit helps you with the next one. Exactly. Uh, because it sets up a track record and you learn from it, you do things differently. So Cognigen was a success in that 
in that uh, manner that we learned a lot it was our first time but we we set the goals very very high and the key thing to remember in entrepreneurship that is not about what you know uh, it's also about who you know and then it's like a recipe you can't make a recipe with one ingredient there's many ingredients so yeah. there is a lot of luck there is a lot of timing besides your technical capability besides your who you know in the market the network because as a small company getting your first few customers is what is difficult that once is. you get that then the momentum builds so it's like a recipe all these things have to come together good people you have to attract you have to share the possibility of success with those good people and uh, it's like a marriage you have to work at all aspects true that <laughs> and you know what makes it easier is uh is that if you actually have like exactly i think that's what you're hitting on is is if you if you actually uh create a system around you of the network and the people that are going to help you get it done get it to the market get the investment without people none of this actually becomes big i believe that's what you're hitting on here you got to get the network of investors network of people that will actually get the job done at the same time who will also help with the marketing of it as well correct and uh, like i said a lot of this is in the initial stages if you take a uh, i give you the example of our second company so the first company was vc funded and we uh said okay we don't want to deal with vcs we want to do it self funded uh -huh. and so we took the money we made from the first company which is what i meant about track record and uh, base hits and we invested it in a self funded second company that was aglet that was aglet technology aglet okay and it was a different set of founders and uh, so city group was our first target customer and we learned oh. that uh, city group <laughs> being a big company is very afraid to work with small companies because small group, they take a long time to uh, you know evaluate things make decisions then once they have made a decision they are like a big ship they cannot turn so easily exactly. so they are afraid with small companies that they may go out of business and suddenly they get left holding the bag exactly. so we learned lessons of that nature that uh, as a small company getting that customer is is very difficult so you need a lot of help and one of the helps is network so somebody you worked with in the past say hey i know these guys they are very reliable so he gives a reference to the senior vp in city group then it, it sort of it's not just the technical capability that is solving your problem it's it's all about everything coming together so you cannot really focus on any one thing you have to do your best and you have to address all the angles you have to realize that you cannot be the expert in everything so you got to surround yourself with good people who are good at the different things marketing sales engineering what and have you how does one how does one do that i think that is where a lot of people struggle with it right is is you know a lot of the entrepreneurs when they're starting off with they they think in that limited sphere here is my business here's my customers and and instead of actually thinking big and you know attracting all the people around that they find that difficult to do right and that's the challenge with most people and i'm sure you know when you started off you went through some of those can you expand upon that so that you know i know viewers will get a lot of value out of that because you know a lot of people do want to make the business as successful but they just don't know how to do it i mean it's it's just like marriage you can have uh, a love marriage where you get to know the person and either because you were high school classmates or you met in college or whatever you then you have many years to get to know each other and then you figure out that it's a good uh, possibility that it's going to work the other way is an arranged marriage type of thing where you're brought together and you meet for a <laughs> one meeting two meeting for a short time and then you decide okay looks like this is going to work but then you have to put in a lot of effort to make it work because you don't know each other and as you go dig deeper and deeper there are going to be differences but how you compromise so startup is the same way many people what happens like 
we did at Cognizant. Uh, these three I used to work with at Chips and Technologies. I spent many years, I got to know them well. So I felt that we could work together. And they actually, actually they came up with the technical idea and they came to me saying that, hey, we need a business guy in our team. Rupan was the hardware guy, George and Rakesh were the software guys, okay. and uh, I was the business guy. So they wanted to form all legs of the table kind of thing. The case of Aglet was two entrepreneurs who were very young. They had no experience. I didn't know them at all. And uh, they were struggling. They thought they could do it on their own. And after uh, nearly two years, they saw that they were not making any progress. So some common friend introduced saying that you need someone who has a broader business kind of a capability to come in and help you uh, not just for selling but if you have to you know position the company for an acquisition or any kind of exit and stuff so that's how i met them i didn't know them from before <laughs> and we spent three years in the process of building the company and getting to know each other so both ways work you have to make it work and and that is that is so nice that you actually that you actually touched on that. It's uh, the people that you work with that maybe your partners within the business. You really have to get to know them and uh, and you know and and build invest into the relationship long term, and then look at who has the strengths in certain areas, who has weaknesses in certain areas, and try to compensate for them because you're working on together as as, a, as an idea. So yeah, that, that's that's amazing. And then there are other growing pains, like if you take our own lives, uh, there is a certain kind of uh, uh, care and stuff required as you're growing through elementary school. Then you think you've grown up and in middle school, you're, how your parents bring you up, how you rely on friends, then in high school and college. The same way with entrepreneurial companies, when you initially start up, it's like giving birth to a baby. It's very small have 10, 20, 30 people kind of know everything that's going on and you think you can do it. Then as the company grows and suddenly you're making 10 million, 20 million revenues, you know, a few hundred people, it requires a very different skill set. And sometimes the founders are just not uh, the right people to take it to that next level. Definitely, so, definitely. So usually what will happen is there'll be a conflict so if the founder realizes and brings an experienced CEO in and uh, you work with it, sometimes that's needed and that works well. Sometimes what will happen is the founder will say, no, no, I think I can do it. And he takes it down. There are many challenges. That's that. Yeah, you're right about that. So, you know, one thing that you just touched on is that, you know, uh, having the company ready for acquisition, right? There's a certain mindset that goes into that versus just running a business, right? A running a business could be something like, you know, simply talking about it. Okay, you're making sales, you're making a profit, you have a business that is bringing you some income, right? But then if you're talking about, you know, venture capitalist or other type of, you know, uh, hedge fund investment or uh, private equity fund, right? When they invest in the business, just generally speaking, what do they look at versus just you know a business that you may be running but they don't have an interest in that because they don't see it this thing scaling to a hundred million dollar company yeah i mean venture investors when they're coming in they are looking big time they are looking for the facebook's of the world so they are looking for a 10x return on their investment as a minimum and as you probably have heard the term unicorn these days, the values have also gone up. A billion dollar evaluation is what they are looking for, for a company to be become billion dollar plus in value. And yeah. so it's a whole different ball game at that play. And it takes many different types of skill sets. Of course, you have a lot of money to work with because they are willing to put several hundred million dollars in investment. The other kinds of entrepreneurial efforts are these smaller efforts where you might start with friends and family, you might get some small investors putting a few million dollars, and then you're able to uh, sustain yourself with revenues and you build a company, 20, 30 million in revenue, 
find that that technology and team is very useful to a larger company which would find it difficult to do it from scratch so then you position the company for an acquisition so when you need large amounts of money investors take away a lot of your company so for example in cognizon in the first round they took away 30% of the company so the founders and employees had 70% after the second round the investors were 75% and the employees and founders were 25% yeah. and luckily we had an exit after that but if we had continued a c round would have taken it to 90% so investors land up taking more of the company so for your 10% to be worth sizable then you got to have a exit valuation which is a billion dollars because then only your 10% is 100 million yeah. whereas if you are in a smaller mode where the investors are not there or the investors hold 30% of the company so even if you sell for uh, uh, 50 million you own 70% of the company the employees and founders so you'll still get 35 or the so it's kind of a math math game mm-hmm. and uh, so building a small company and setting it up for an acquisition is a lot easier than building a large company and taking it public so even after taking it public let me give you an example you may be familiar with the first internet hosting company was called exodus and it was very successful it went public one of the founders i knew he was worth 700 million on paper mm-hmm. but you can't sell he can't sell all his stock because if he sells all his stock the stock price will crash yeah. so he is allowed to sell a little bit at a time within 2 years exodus went bankrupt wow so uh, just because you go public doesn't mean uh, it is successful it has to be like the ibm so the sun microsystems or the oracles of the world where or microsoft where you're successful for many many years yeah you have, you have to sustain that. yourself definitely sure so uh, less um, so Uh, with argusoft right let's talk a little bit about that so uh, i understand for argusoft it was a company founded by your brother and now and then you had joined later on and uh, so i know argusoft is a big organization what 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 are all the different business services that it entails that argusoft does so argusoft was started by my brother he studied here in florida at the florida institute of technology mm-hmm. in orlando melbourne florida and uh, he chose to go back to india right after and so he went back to india he was uh, playing around trying to do some startups he wanted to be an entrepreneur from day one mm-hmm. so uh, finally in 2000 he started this software uh, started as a training company and then became a software services company i was nowhere in software so i was just helping him with some uh, business development and clients he was small enough that one client a year was good enough <laughs> so my job was easy then after i finished my experience with aglet he said hey i still have remained a 50 person company and uh, why don't you come on in and let's try to build this a little more and create an exit because argusoft started in 2000 so it's nearly 21 years old now Uh-huh. Yeah. So congratulations that, for that. That's a, that's a long running company especially being privately owned. That's that's right. very nice. So Argusoft is privately guys, owned, no investors, no debts and uh, we You guys have been, grown sizably to our senior journey over the years. Uh, I know that you know visiting the Argusoft website it almost seems like every time you look at it the team just grows from this to this to this. So it's nice. So in 2007 when I joined my brother uh, we used to be about 50 people uh-huh. and uh, so today now uh, in about 15 years time we are uh, 200 people so we've awesome. grown awesome. the head head count uh, four times the revenue also has grown about six times so That's from awesome. a small revenue we become and this is the clear example of a base hit where we've made a conscious decision that we want to provide a good quality experience to our customers and 
and not worry about suddenly growing to be if you suddenly grow to be a big big boy you get into trouble you have to grow through the elementary middle school high school and college path that is awesome that is awesome so ram a little bit about what is what is your why in 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 your you know i know you are always learning you're always trying to grow yourself even though you've had many successes you're still always pushing yourself because you you always every time i talk to you you are always learning new things you're sharing new things with me and you're always so involved in technology and business and all of that what keeps you what keeps you motivated and inspired so i think the it's sort of dependent on your personality as well as a lot is dependent on the environment so being in the silicon valley environment was a big reason for thinking out of narrowly but the common analogy i use is you know people think being your own boss is great you don't have to listen to anyone and it's a wonderful <laughs> life so commonly i describe that an entrepreneurial journey is like flying a single engine plane so there's only one engine you are in control and you control everything nobody tells you what to do but if the engine fails or you don't do the right things and fly the plane properly it'll crash and die But as if you are sitting in a 747, you are sitting in the corner. There are four pilots. There are another four pilots sleeping to take over. There is all these air hostesses. They come serve you food. You watch movies, and it's a huge plane, so it's not very turbulent. And uh, but you are a small piece in the big puzzle going along. But you still reach your destination and the, the journey. So that's the corporate world. So you got to choose between the two. There are pluses and minuses with both. Yeah. And uh, you got to see what sort of excites you. And secondly, it's it's really about the passion. You can't go into entrepreneurship with the money that I want to make money. That's the whole wrong attitude. Money always will come. It will follow if you have the passion. And you definitely Definitely. and i'm so i'm so glad that you actually shared that because a lot of people get into it for the idea of money because they you know a lot of people think simply in the terms that business equals making a profit money but that only happens like you said if you're actually passionate about something because it shows in everything you know i i on a on a business side of things when i knew you back in 2006 it shows in your services it shows in your presentation it shows in your products and all of that and that's what people use to that's that's what the decision point that people make to buy the services not how much money an entrepreneur wants to make right it's all about the energy that you're bringing to the table yeah. and uh, it's kind of important because otherwise you lose sight and you're always correcting oh this is not going to make money this is going to be a big loss and your judgment starts getting clouded so you need to keep going on your passion within reason i mean you can't some people go madly in one direction and refusing to listen or believe in anyone else around them so you have to be able to take the opinions value it and then form your final uh, opinion to proceed Definitely. be open be open to uh be open to adjusting your thoughts and your ideas and yeah and be able to mold yourself to success that's 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 awesome so uh so what's uh ram what is next for you as a as an entrepreneur like what are you currently working on i know you're still the as a managing director of argusoft that company is always you know doing projects and things and then anything you like to share on that front so uh like i said you know we the, the wrap with service companies from india was that the quality is not as good as the one would like to expect so we kind of modeled it and said that we were going to remain small but we were going to provide a very uh, good engagement experience for our clients and so that was the services side that puts the food on the table but the bigger goal we had as we started growing in age and career was that we wanted to do something that benefited humanity in general as a way of giving back because it's not just about making money beyond a certain point in life you feel that you you need some other kind of a goal so my personal goal when i was growing up 
all my best friends in high school they all went and did medicine <laughs> so maybe maybe that was an influence because both my doctor daughters are doctors so <laughs> sometimes i wonder whether i swayed them in that direction uh, so i always wanted to do something associated with healthcare that's how i started with bioengineering uh, fortunately or unfortunately brought me to silicon valley and took me away from that and uh, I mean, just to give you a quick summary, my project in IIT was a, a syntactic pattern recognition-based uh, cardiac arrhythmia monitor. Wow. In, uh, in uh, Canada, for my master's, my thesis was on a somatosensory spinal evoke potential-based monitor for scoliosis surgery. You know, some children have that bent spine problem. So this was a monitor to help during the surgery monitor if any damage has happened. So I wanted to do something in healthcare and also having come out of India, I wanted to do something that uh, uh, was in the Indian or developing countries environment. And so we started working on this concept of leveraging technology mm -hmm. to bring healthcare to the masses, especially in developing countries. Uh, the doctors are enough business to cover people in the cities. So in rural areas, villages and smaller towns, I mean, women were dying of very known causes like a breech pregnancy, an umbilical cord is around the neck of the baby. It's a very known condition that can be rectified. And if it's not rectified, it can be disastrous for both the baby and the mother. So things like that, very known conditions that could be prevented. Basic care like immunization, mother and child care was the primary focus. And so mostly there are these pseudo nurses who are in the field and uh, the no doctors go there because of the infrastructure and there is no money. So we came up with this platform where using mobile phones, we wanted to empower women as well because mm -hmm. in those villages they trust somebody from the village and mm -hmm. women traditionally were just doing cooking and cleaning so they were very excited to learn cell phones and how to use them and go around and help their other uh, village mates and uh, so we captured what a doctor would do I mean, fortunately for us, we don't have all these regulations and stuff like in the US. So uh, we were able to capture what a doctor would do if you were there in those situations. Okay. And we trained these nurses to follow those like cheat sheets mm -hmm. and actually provide the care. Mm -hmm. And it also was a way by which you could push the tasks so they knew exactly what to do. And as they did the task, they fed in the uh, results of it. The software captured it into the main system in the cloud and all the stakeholders along the way could go in through the cloud and monitor what was going on, see trends and do the corrections, etc. Exactly. And you know what, and I saw that I'm going to add a clip of that to this video when we do the final presentation as well. That was a health 2.0 uh, presentation that you had done on the app that was created. And I thought that the idea was so neat to be able to leverage the current technology that's out there using old cell phones to be able to use the step-by-step -step process to diagnose. And, you know, perhaps if you do have a, a situation where you need to talk to the doctor, the field worker can do that at that time directly in communication. And, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, that happened all live uh, at any given time, right? And which, is, which is great, I think. We just had a simple uh, traffic light, red, yellow, green model. Uh -huh. So uh, it, it would traverse the trees in terms of triaging. If everything was within the limits, then it would give a green light at the end so the worker knew that they continued the uh, regular process. If it came yellow, they said, okay, there is an impending danger here, so we should monitor this patient a little more frequently. And if it came red, Basically, they would then, the case history would be available on the doctor's phone. The worker can 
call the doctor with the press of a button, have a discussion, and the doctor decides, okay, this is something serious, get the patient in an ambulance to the nearest hospital, or it looks serious, but uh, we can wait and watch it, whatever we need. And you know, and that's what I really liked about it as well. And I was thinking about that yesterday and as, as I was putting together that video that you had shared, is that it's so simple too. At the end of the day, you want to make things that are that are useful and simple for people to use. Like you exactly said, it has a green light, it has an orange light, and it has the red light. As simple as it sounds, green, green, you're good to go, yellow, you monitor, and the red, you actually get in touch with the doctor. And that's that's so useful leverage of the technology and simplicity of you know the idea and execution of it. That's congratulations on that. And I and I and I actually found that very neat. It was nice. So this this was the first generation implementation of that uh, platform, and now that platform is in the third generation. We call this the public health platform, and uh, now it's called the Techo Plus. And the prime minister actually uh, launched that in the state of Gujarat, oh, so wow. we're covering 65 million people. Well, that is awesome with, with the software for the whole state of Gujarat. That is awesome. So Ram, you know, uh, I had an amazing uh, conversation with you and I want to summarize a couple of the points that we picked up today uh, after this discussion. One is that if you want to succeed in, as an entrepreneur, the number one thing is, and uh, and it's that you got to follow your passion, right? Without passion, don't, don't just go after doing what you're doing just for the money. Do it for what you're passionate about and the money will follow you. And the uh, second thing I picked up is that you got to be, be able to build a team around you, which is going to be your co-founders, your investors, and other people who can help you take your idea and build it up. And that's that's great. Anything else you would like to add that I missed? Uh, the other key lesson I would say is that don't sort of have an expectation that the very first time you embark on entrepreneurship, you will be successful. And uh, if you are not successful, the failure hits you so hard that you say, okay, this is not for me. Go back to a corporate world and you're unhappy. And, uh, you know, you lose all the positivity in life. Always look at it as a glass is half full. So even if the first effort is a failure, learn from the mishaps and then do the second one, do the third one. So many people are successful. Uh, after multiple tries mm -hmm. very few are successful after the first try and even fewer are successful in a very huge manner like the facebook's and google's so uh, i mean it's kind of a funny story because google was the brainchild of sergey brin and larry page mm -hmm. sergey used to be the phd student of a classmate of mine rajiv Motwani, uh -huh. who's no more you know, unfortunate accident with that. He was such a brilliant person because uh, when he did his PhD at Berkeley, mm -hmm. New York Times published an op-ed, full page op-ed saying if there was a Nobel Prize for computer science that he would get it. He was so brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so his ranking based algorithm was the basis of the Google search. And Sergey was a student and he told Sergey that Forget about your PhD for the time being, go and start the company. Wow. So when he was taking them out to get the funding from Sequoia, he, uh, we used, I used to call him Mort Wayne. He so said, mm -hmm. Rajiv, uh, so he said, Ram, why don't you join these guys? Uh, I think, you know, it will be a big success. So I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, we're building a, a different kind of a search engine. So my reaction to him was, Yet another search engine, there's Alta Vista, there is Yahoo, uh -huh. says Twain. I mean, there's nothing new here. So what uh, what is it that will make this such a phenomenal success? He said, trust me, Ram, this is going to be big. Uh -huh. So come in uh, at the ground level. And I said, Twain, why don't you, that was around the time I just got funding for Cognizant. So it was kind of very difficult for me to drop that because then my reputation would have gone into the toilet. So I said, Motwain, look, it's a little bit late for me. So why don't you go ahead? And if in a year's time, mine is not moving that great. And if you're doing well, I'll come and join you. And so the rest is history where 
Google is. So it's kind of very interesting uh, on how things evolve. I wanted to share that story. That yeah, that is awesome. Glad you shared that. So, um, so to get a hold of you, to get contact you, what is the best way to reach out to you for the viewers and the listeners? I know I will share the link for Argusoft uh, here uh, as well uh, through the podcast. Anything else you would like to share your contact info? Any any message for people that are watching this right now? So I'm always glad to uh, help people in advising through my experiences as advisor and mentors for many entrepreneurs. Uh, <laughs> you can reach me through my email, uh, ramgopalan at argosoft.com or my mobile number. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll share it in the podcast. Absolutely. Always glad to help in any way I can. That is awesome. So glad that you joined us today, Ram. It's an, I think this this was a power packed conversation where you just left a you know a lot of useful information for entrepreneurs out there. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas, your knowledge, and your wealth of expertise. Um, it was our pleasure to have you today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here, and I hopefully, even if it's ten percent value, uh, I hope it. I, I, think so the, I think people will find a lot. Of, I think that just generally speaking, I think it just makes it so much easier for anybody to find any success at any level. If you connect with people that have already done it, you don't have to figure things out. It just makes everything so much easier. And that is the reason why I wanted to get you on today. And I, I felt we did that successfully because you shared so much. Thank you so much, Ram. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ram.